Hello world. A while back I came across this annual, which I don't think was mine back in the uh, 70s, back in 1977 or 76, because they, as you know, annuals get released the year before the date on them. But I found it. I've kept hold of it. Sadly, it's got a, uh, a, cu a couple of pages missing, but it's actually Fab 208. All right, Fab 208 was the name given to Radio Luxembourg. Now, Radio Luxembourg was a station that was broadcasting uh, from a, the early 1930s, uh, came off the air during the war. Uh, there's a, something really bizarre, actually, the, the transmitters were used by someone called Lord Haw Haw, who broadcast uh, pro-Nazi propaganda on there to English speaking audiences and was actually hanged for uh, doing so. That was during the, uh, the the war years. But then the Americans took it over until from 1944 till the end of the war. And then uh, it went back to being commercial radio. It was the only commercial radio that was available to people in the UK at that time uh, because the BBC and the British government forbade advertising on the air and didn't lift that ban till 1973. For a long time, it was the only way that teenagers got their dose of pop music because the BBC were very staid about doing so. In 1964, Radio Caroline uh, went on the air. It was a sort of pirate ship, as it was called, pirate radio, and it was basically broadcast from a ship off the Essex coast in in the UK. That was taken down, and then the government ordered the BBC to start Radio 1, basically, which came on the air uh, in September 1967. So by 1976 or 77, as it were, when this came out, I don't imagine that many people bought this annual because they wanted to listen to uh, Radio Luxembourg. Radio Luxembourg only had about 15 more years left in it when this came out here, all right? The actual Fab 208 magazine and annual uh, was uh, released from 64 until 1980. Um, but the radio station chunted on till uh, 1991. So I think the um, the primary sort of target of magazines like this would have been young girls. This is full of beauty, hair, fashion tips, pop stars, mainly male pop stars. Um, so there would be a very few closeted gay males perhaps reading this, myself included. This, finding this, was a bit of a of a throwback to me. And the thing that really made me laugh about it was the fact that these these sorts of magazines like Debbie and Jackie and in the 80s magazines like Just 17 uh, were just full of fictional stories that were, I think that there must have been some sort of competition going on to outdo each other in terms of how tragic they could make the stories. And I found one in here which I thought I'd read to you, but it's called I Wish I Could Tell You. Oh, and there's the Osmonds there, happy families. Funnily enough, by the time this came out at the end of 1976, nobody gave a toss about the Osmonds or the Bay City Rollers anymore. People were burning their Bay City Rollers posters and stuff and embracing punk, but that's another story. Okay, here's this story. He leant over to kiss her for the last time as a gesture of friendship, but she turned her head quickly. No, Glenn, she murmured, don't. You aren't making it any easier. I wonder if that's because Glenn probably hadn't had a bath since last week. <laughs> no, 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 it is probably not. He nodded, thinking he understood how she felt and moved away so that the distance between them was just right. Not too far 
so that they no longer seemed friends, but not as close as they could once have been. She was searching desperately for the right words so that she could say goodbye the way she wanted to, but in a way that would not leave him feeling guilty. But no words seemed adequate, and so no words came. He wasn't to feel guilty. She wanted to tell him that because she had, a, she had broken a rule as well. He did not know, and she felt she had to tell him before he went, but she was scared. Not of him. He would never hurt her, but she was scared of the possibility that they would part as enemies and not as friends. He would have every right to hate her if she told him. She hadn't meant to mention Graham to him, hoping that he wouldn't need to be mentioned, but if she told Glenn now, he would realise this and could well end up despising her for her deception. And she didn't want that. She wouldn't be able to live with it. So the struggle to explain carried on inside her confused mind, while the answer still remained hidden. You're not mad at me, Jill, he asked, his voice full of anxiety cutting into her turmoil. I don't think that was a very anxious voice, was it? You're not mad at me, Jill, he asked, his voice full of anxiety cutting into her turmoil. She shook herself mentally and nodded. Then, shaking her head madly, she stammered, No, no, I'm not, Glenn, honest, I'm not mad at you. He looked at her closely. <laughs> he looked at her closely, the concern expressed in his eyes genuine. She held his gaze for a matter of seconds, then turned her face away from his penetrating eyes. Tell him, she screamed inwardly, for God's sake, tell him. I'm not mad at you, Glenn, she repeated lamely, frustration causing her to irritably push her hair back from her eyes. He shrugged. You've every right to be, he said, the unfairness of his trusting nature tormenting her physically. She held her sides, crying gently, as she shook her head slowly. She wasn't going to. She knew it. He wasn't going to know from her. But still, she searched for the courage she lacked. Still, she hoped it would reach her in time. I didn't want to hurt you, Jill, you know that, but if I'd gone on pretending I loved you, we'd both end up hurt, worse than now. I'm right, and you'll accept it later, given time. He paused, looking for any reaction and finding none, only tears. Don't cry, Jill, he begged suddenly, putting his hand on her shoulder. I'd do anything to make you feel better. You know I would. Anything, she questioned bitterly, and immediately she regretted that remark. She had no right to blame him, to put her guilt down to him, and she flung herself into his arms, crying loudly, wishing he was still hers, but most of all wishing the words that tormented her conscience would come. But even in his comforting arms and surrounded with his genuine concern, she could explain. I didn't mean that, Glenn. I didn't mean it, she sobbed, hoping he would believe her. Oh, wow, I didn't mean to say that. OK, love, it's OK, he murmured, his arms strong around her and his words warm and friendly. Friendly, but not loving. Forget you said it, and so will I. He waited until she had stopped shaking, and then he released her, holding her away and looking closely at her. Then he said gently, aren't you going to tell me? She went rigid with surprise and then trembled with shock as she whispered hoarsely, tell you what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he sighed. What you've been trying to get out all this time? She caught her breath as relief flooded out the terror that had engulfed her whole body. He didn't know, 
she could still tell him, I, I, it's a, you, she stammered. And then she broke down as she realised Glenn was not going to hear it from her. Not now, not ever. He'd hear it from someone else and his pride would be damaged and she would be to blame for it. Forget it, Jill, he was saying. I don't want to know. I'm sorry we had to end. You're a great girl and I'm glad we're still friends. He had no idea. He hadn't even begun to realise. He paused awkwardly. I just wish I could have met her after this. It must be kind of hard to know you're being um, packed in for someone else. Jill choked. That hurt. As his words had summed up her thoughts. She wanted to yell at him that he hadn't been the only one either. But that seemed terrible when she thought it over. He would be embarrassed, afraid that she'd spread the word he was a big head when he was doing his best to make her feel better. He was moving away from her and she knew he was going. She straightened up and wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. He turned. She turned too and with their back facing each other they walked away awkwardly. Suddenly she whirled round, the words at last ready to be said, but Glenn carried on walking. The words were in her mind, but it was too late. So the torment inside her carried on, and the guilt continued to weigh down, and it was all a physical pain in her heart. Her mind a confused muddle of emotions. She walked on and on, down the footpath and through the gate and into an oncoming lorry. <laughs> Try not to laugh. <laughs> Try not to laugh. <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> He would never hear the words from her and he would never know or understand why she had kept it from him. The end. So it was for stories like that that people brought magazines like Fab 208 and annuals like Fab 208 in the 70s. It wasn't for the DJs or for Radio Luxembourg. Radio Luxembourg was on its last limbs by this time. It packed in finally by 1991. But yeah, uh, all of the decent DJs that have been on, uh, uh, on Fab 208, Radio Luxembourg, have been snuffled up by Radio 1, and it would have been Radio 1 back in the mid 70s that people would have listened to, but they would have got their, their romance story kicks from magazines like this. Hope you enjoyed that story and I'm sorry I was slightly irreverent about it, but yeah, <laughs> it was crap, wasn't it? Don't forget to like, subscribe, share if you dare, and perhaps give a thanks. Bye.